Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Ivory Mennonite Church this morning. It's a beautiful day. I want to disturb you a bit. Um, find one person you haven't talked to for maybe a week or and say hi. Just one person that you never talked to before. <laughs> You have, you, have, you have two minutes because we started Ari. So just find one person. How does that feel? <laughs> Good, right? <Yes. laughs> so welcome to uh, our call of worship from our voices together, 800-860-860. Oh my God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are are Eden. Cleanse the thought of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. I invite us to sing together, and if we're able, um, we'll stand to sing. We're going to start with number 367, and I invite the singing group to join us, and Janet is going to sing with us as well. We, as a group up here, will sing verse 1 in Swahili to introduce it a little bit, and then we invite you all to join us singing verse 1 in Swahili again, and then we will all sing verse 1 in English. 367, and I invite us to stand.
Amen. Please remain standing, if able, and we'll turn to number 369, our song of the month. There is nothing worth more. And we will sing verse 1 and verse 2, then the refrain, and then we'll do that same thing again. We'll go into the bridge twice and then end on the refrain, and I'll call it out.
please join me on the lightning of the peace candle. God of peace. Christ Christ of peace. peace. Our confession time today is very different. Different. We are going to sing a song rather than um, expressing ourselves in words. So, here, would you come? Let's sing together number 155 Lord, I Need You. Let's take a moment of silence.
Hillary, would you come again for the hymn of assurance? Number 163, Amazing Grace. 163. Children, would you come forward, please? Children, turn. to have you. You know what? You're going to maybe want to sit over here because we're going to be watching something on the video here. Great. You can, you can come through. That's great. We're so glad to see you all. Today is Pentecost. <clears throat> it's a very important event and it's a happy time. You see all these colors and all these colors here. It's a happy time because Jesus he went up and went back to heaven, but he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to all the disciples, and he told them, wait. And they waited, and they waited, and waited. And we're going to hear more of that story in a little bit on the video, and it's going to tell us a little bit more of the story, and you're going to find out why we're so happy today. So we're going, Mary's going to turn it on, and you guys can face that little screen the big screen isn't here with us today, and uh, those of you who can't see, you can hear the story because it's a storyteller, just like Mary, and he's going to tell the story. So long after God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, and way after God led the Israelites through the desert as a pillar of fire, and a few days after Jesus died and rose from the dead, Jesus appeared to his disciples and said, that soon they were going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. But the disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant, so they asked Jesus. And Jesus said all they had to do was wait in the city, Jerusalem, for God to keep his promise. 
again. The disciples were confused. They asked if that meant God was finally going to restore the world. But Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said this, right before their eyes, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Did you, did you, but he went, he like, he went up. Fast forward a few days to the day of Pentecost. Okay, quick side note. Pentecost means 50, like the number five zero. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover, which was another holiday Jewish people celebrated. Israelites from all over the world came to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. That's important. People from all over the world come together in one place. Remember that. Back to the story. All the disciples were together in someone's house, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire place. There was basically a mini tornado hurricane thing puffing and puffing around in someone's living room. It was amazing. Then it got even amazing. Fire appeared on the ceiling, divided up into tongues of fire. There was fire on top of everyone's head. And no one was even getting their hair burnt up or anything. Imagine if blazing lasers suddenly started shooting out of your head. So maybe it wasn't lasers. It was probably somewhere between like a really big candle flame and laser. Like a candle laser! Okay, another quick side note. A lot of times in the Old Testament, God's presence showed up as fire. Burning bush, pillar of fire, and even in the holy tent or the temple, God's spirit appeared like fire. But here's the thing. Now God's spirit wasn't dwelling in a bush or a pillar or a temple. The Holy Spirit was dwelling in people. What Jesus had promised came true. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit of God himself was going into people's physical bodies. That's like a superhero moment when an ordinary person suddenly gets new special powers. And the disciples did get new special powers. They could suddenly speak in other languages that they hadn't known before. Okay, okay, hold up. This fire windstorm comes from heaven and the result is people could speak in other languages? Mm -hmm. How could this be a part of God's plan? Well, remember what Jesus said. When power from the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, they would tell people about Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, where everyone basically spoke the same languages. And also they would go to the ends of the earth. Think about it. People on the other side of the world don't speak the same language you do. How do you tell them anything? especially about the most important thing that's ever happened in human history. If you don't understand them, and they don't understand you. Well, because of the mighty rushing wind and fire, a huge crowd of people came together to figure out what was going on. Remember, there were people from all over the world. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontusians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Libyans, Cretans, Arabians, Romulans. No, not Romulans. Romans. They thought the disciples might be drunk or something because they seemed to be babbling. But then they realized each one of the people listening could hear the disciples speaking in their own language. Then Peter, one of the disciples, stood up and spoke to the crowd. He said, God declares, I will pour my spirit and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the disciples baptized 3,000 people in a single day. The day of Pentecost. Seriously, you can read about this in the Bible. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, God had kept his promise to send the Holy Spirit. And he's also promised that when Jesus comes back to earth, he's going to make everything new again. And I can't wait for you to hear that story. I kind of forgot how fast he talks as a storyteller. Mary would say, that is far too fast. <laughs> Was that really fast? Like blah, 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 blah. Did you get any of the story, though? Yes. Even though that, you know, there are some exciting parts there, and there are exciting parts. Just imagine Pastor Tim starting to preach. Okay, there he's preaching away. All of a sudden, he starts speaking <gasps> Swahili. Ooh. Or Hmong. Oh. Or Hindi. Oh. And some of you would go, wait, 
He's not speaking English anymore. And that was an exciting time when everybody could hear the message of God. But you know, that was then, but that doesn't mean it's not now. We all have the Holy Spirit with us, and lots better than Spider-Man. We have power. And today the Spirit comforts, guides us, holds our hand, and gives us strength to face our problems. So we have something to celebrate. Greg told me, don't get it all over everything. So I'm, I'm going to put it on here. Yay! It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> See, I got it just here. All right, some on me. So let's go ahead and have a prayer. Thank you for giving us a comfort mothering spirit who is always with us. May we share that love of God with others and keep us safe this summer as we pray together. Amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is scripture time, and Joyce is going to read that Psalms 100, 104 in English, and then Pratik will, will read Numbers 11, verse 24 to 30. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes the wind his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with deep as with the garment. The water stood above the mountains. But as your rebuke to the waters fled and the sound of your thunder, they took to fight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. He makes springs pour water into ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkey quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by their waters. They sing among their branches. They he waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants the man to cultivate. Bring forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens the heart of man. Oil to make his face shine and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered and cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests. The stork has his home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats, the crags of the refuge for the conies. The moon marks off the seasons and the sun shows, knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek the food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. The man goes out to his work and his labor until evening. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom, you make them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things beyond large and small. 
There are ships to go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you formed to Phronic there. These all look to you to give them their food of proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open it, open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who knows at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him. As I rejoice in the Lord, but may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. The second reading for, from the scripture today is uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he also gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the clouds and spoke to him, and he took off the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do it again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those who had been registered, but had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his young, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous of, for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. Thank you, Pratik and uh, Joyce. Jackie, we uh, read for you. Happy Pentecost, everyone. We don't often say that. Happy Easter, Merry Christmas, but Happy Pentecost. It is lovely to be here. Um, I've already told some of you that I was stunned to see that it was 23 years ago that I was a pastoral intern here. And um, I was only, in the year 2000, I was 25 years old. So you did not look down on me because I was young. You gave, like Paul would advise you, you gave me a chance. And I, looking back, I am just so honored that you um, opened your arms to me, especially when your pastor was in Europe on sabbatical, right? And I, as I think back at that summer, I'm just so grateful for the team of elders that worked with me. Um, Erland Waltner of Blessed Memory was a great support. Um, it was a very formative time for me, and, I, and, and I, I feel very blessed that you gave me that chance when I was figuring out my own identity and calling um, and it's so good to be back. I'm grateful for the video, the very animated video today, especially since we didn't read from Acts chapter 2. Um, and as we think about Pentecost, I think that's the story that dances in our minds, right? That's what we imagine. It infuses our imaginations when we hear Pentecost. The, the spirit poured out, tongues of fire resting on their heads. 
We might even think about this as the Pentecost story, kind of like we think of the Christmas story or the Easter story. But Pentecost was a Jewish holiday that occurred yearly. So this, this story that we think of as the original Pentecost story isn't actually the first Pentecost. Instead, it's the story of something significant that happened on Pentecost, on that Jewish feast day, when the disciples were gathered together to celebrate. And Jews today still celebrate Pentecost called Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks. And because Passover and Easter lined up pretty well this year, it turns out that Jewish folks finished up their Shavuot festival yesterday, and so quite close to our own Pentecost Sunday. And just some fun facts, because today we're going to get a little bit nerdy about festivals and the Book of Numbers. Hope you're ready for it. Um, Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks, occurs seven weeks after Passover, as the video said, on the 50th day, and hence its Greek name, Pentecost. It's one of three festivals historically that would bring the Jewish people to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, thus the international crowd of Jewish folks in Jerusalem in Acts 2. It was a harvest festival where people brought the first fruits in anticipation of God blessing the remainder, It's also the day commemorating the Israelites receiving God's gift of Torah. So our our Jewish siblings over the past couple of days as they worshiped at their synagogues um, celebrated Shavuot by attending services in which the Ten Commandments were highlighted. They read the entire book of Ruth as is traditional during Shavuot and they ate sweet foods, especially dairy products, um, to remind them of how um, somewhere in Torah, the Israelites are compared to young children or babes first receiving the Torah. And so what do babies drink? They drink milk. And so they eat, they eat dairy products to remind them of this sweet time in their history when they first received the gift of Torah from God. And so this is the festival that was being celebrated, that had been celebrated for many years in Jerusalem, in Acts 2, when, when our story of Pentecost in Acts, the Christian story of Pentecost, takes place. Something remarkable happened on that festival, the Spirit's appearance. However it, remarkable it was, it was not unique. In fact, it follows in a robust biblical tradition of the Spirit falling on people, the Spirit rushing into people, the spirit empowering people. Think of, first of all, the wind, the spirit of God in Genesis 1 at the creation of the world. Think of the breath of God animating the first human in Genesis 2. That too is spirit. You might know stories about Gideon or Samson or the much less well-renowned Othniel, all judges upon whom the spirit of God rushed upon them and empowered them to do big projects. Ezekiel the prophet testified that the Spirit of God fell upon him too. And think about Elisha. Elisha, who, who was the, the student of Elijah, and Elisha requested that God grant him a double portion of his mentor Elijah's spirit. And later those observing Elisha could tell the spirit of Elijah is upon him. So the Spirit of God fell on humans, filled humans, empowered humans, all throughout the biblical tradition. So what happened in Acts 2 was remarkable, but it also followed on, it followed on, it, 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 it built on, it connected to stories from the Jewish scriptures that the disciples and their audience would have known. So in the Bible, the spirit moves and stirs and rushes and fills. And in Acts, the tongues of fire rest, rest on the heads of the people. The spirit also rests on the prophets in numbers. Spirit at rest. I'm intrigued by the language of of these tongues of fire resting, of the spirit resting. Um, it literally, the, the, literally, it's just the word for sitting in Greek. I looked it up just because I was like, is it rest in the New Testament? The, the, the tongues of fire just sit there 
like your head is the, is the seat for them, the throne for them, right? We often associate the spirit with action and power and charisma and movement. To be inspired is to be filled with life and zest, right? But the spirit also dwells, fills, settles, and is at rest and present and steady with us. Maybe like a garment or like the warmth of the summer sun, something that fills us and stays with us. In Numbers, the spirit rested upon the 70 elders of Israel chosen to assist Moses. Now Moses was stressed out. Moses went to God in a very forlorn state, right? He needed help, God decided, and so God instructed these 70 elders to assist Moses in leading the people. The spirit also rested upon the two named prophets in this story, Eldad and Medad. Note the spirit's journey. The spirit first was on Moses. Moses had the spirit of God. He was the leader. That's all they needed. But some of that spirit, that's what it says, some of that spirit was taken and distributed and placed upon the 70. And after that happened, then they prophesied. Same thing with Eldad and Medad. The spirit rested, then they prophesied. Now a little side note, Eldad and Medad, we don't hear a lot about them. They only appear here in the Bible. But their names might mean something like about love. They might be related to one of the, one of the Hebrew words for love, yadad. Hear that dod at the end of each one of those, Eldad, Medad. So to name a child Eldad might mean God loves. God loves this child, perhaps. Maydad could mean who is loved, as in this is one who is loved. So these are positive, complimentary, favorable, auspicious names, right? They indicate divine favor. When we hear these names, we expect good things. And yet their actions were critiqued by some. Let's zoom out for a minute and get a little bit... um, a little bit nerdy about the whole Numbers 11, right? Because this is a long chapter with a lot of stuff going on. Eldad and Maydad and the story of the spirit upon them is a story within a story. The larger story of Numbers 11 has been puzzling because it blends two sets of concerns. Moses, as I said, on the edge of burnout, um, needing something to change, and then the shared prophecy, which is the response to that. And then on the other hand, the people who can't bear their monotonous diet of divinely provided manna anymore. So what do these two stories have to do with one another? Well, God is presented with requests in these stories. The people ask Moses for something more than the same thing over and over. The the manna that they gather, yes, it's a miracle, but it's the same every day. So the people are are worried. I mean, you know, they're depressed about that. Would you like to eat white bread every day for 40 years, right? Um, You know, it's easy to get a little grumpy at the Israelites. Why aren't you grateful? But I'm kind of sympathetic. Um, Moses also has a request, even a complaint. This is too much for me, God. These are your people. You are their parent. And yet you give them to me? Am I their Am I their nursing father? He actually calls himself a nursing father, that I, should, that I should take care of them like a nurse? They are your people. God, you parent them. Moses gets so discouraged that he even asks God to take his life. Now, God seemingly grants the people's request for variety by sending them a gift of quail meat. However, it doesn't turn out well because right after the quail meat, there's a deadly plague. That's another sermon. But God pointedly does not grant Moses' wish. Instead, God says, you're going to share the leadership, right? The result is a provocative chapter of these two different concerns, these two different complaints that raises questions about judgment, mercy, power sharing, right? This is the larger context in which we get this little nugget about Eldad and Medad. So within that larger complex story, is the account of shared prophetic work made possible by the Spirit of God at rest upon a community. I want to take a minute, partly inspired by, I didn't know if I'd be brave enough to do this, but partly inspired by Janet, I'm going to invite you to talk to one another for a minute. 
Um, and I want you to imagine, consider, when you heard this story and you heard that the spirit rested on these prophets and then they started prophesying, what did you picture happening? What did they do? What does it mean that they started prophesying? Does it involve actions or words? Something else? Because we're not told what that means in this context. And the Bible gives us varied models of what it means to be a prophet. When Eldad and Maydad, the spirit rested upon them. They started prophesying. Everybody noticed and was like, what are they doing? They're not with the official 70 that are, that are supposed to do this. They're just out in the middle of normal folks prophesying. What do you imagine happening? What are they doing? Take a minute to get in touch with your imagination. What did you picture? What do you expect? And then we're going to take one minute. I'm going to time us. I can see the clock in the second hand to share with your neighbor what you pictured when I said they prophesied. Ready? Find a neighbor, find a partner. You have one minute. I'm going to call you back. I'm going to call you back, but I'm going to give you another one minute. This time discuss why was it a problem that Eldad and Maydad started prophesying outside the place where the other people were? What, like, wh why was that a threat? What do you think? One minute, and then I won't make you talk anymore. All right, take about five seconds to finish up. Give you a chance to find your seats again. All right, if you're brave enough, raise your hand if this is what you said. Did you imagine um, spoken words as a part of prophecy? Okay, a lot of people. Did you imagine um, having visions? Yeah, we've got a couple. How about um, ecstatic movement? Maybe dance, maybe some other kind of bodily movement. Did you, did you expect them to be silent and meditative? Anybody? Not necessarily. Was this active and disruptive? How many of you thought it was an active and disruptive? Okay, yeah. Now we are not told what it meant that they prophesied. Um, I am kind of convinced, I'm pretty convinced, by one scholar named John Levison that probably what is intended here is not an ecstatic frenzy, but rather a community, a communal visionary experience. That doesn't mean they were silent necessarily, but rather than everybody sort of prophesying chaotically at the same time something different, the shared leadership of this passage, this scholar thinks, 
indicates a shared visionary communal experience. And one of the reasons is because the only other time that Moses hangs out with 70 elders and shares leadership with them is in the book of Exodus chapter 24. When, this is one of my favorite stories in the Hebrew scriptures because it's just so weird. Um, they ascend a mountain. They have a communal vision and behold God who is standing on a pavement of sapphire. Like, you're not supposed to see God, right? That's supposed to be too powerful for humans to bear. But here they see God, and then they sit down and have, a, have dinner with God at the top of the mountain. Like, and so th that shared visionary experience uses some of the same vocabulary. The 70 elders are there. So this scholar thinks maybe that's what's going on. But other scholars think it was more chaotic and frenzied. We don't know for sure. But it's interesting that prophecy, prophesying, might bring up something different for all of us when we try to imagine the story playing out. Now about Eldad and Maydad, Joshua has a problem with them, but Moses doesn't, right? Eldad and Maydad, the problem might be, how many of you said in your discussion that the problem was that they were prophesying in the wrong location? Did anyone say that? Because they weren't with the other prophets. They were like not around the, the tabernacle where God dwelled, right? In their midst, they were just out with the normal folks. So it might be location. How many of you said that they weren't on the list? They weren't among the 70 people that were supposed to get the spirit, okay? So scholars say both those things. And some scholars think it was one. Some scholars think it was the other. Um, some scholars are like, no, they were on the list. They just weren't in the right place. Others are like, no, they were not on the list. This is just the spirit spilling out on people that weren't officially sanctioned. In either case, that sort of disorderly outside of the approved chain of command, right, from God to Moses to the 70, Joshua, Moses's support and assistant, perceived it as a potential threat, maybe, I think, right? Maybe if everybody saw Maydad and Eldad, maybe the other prophets had a little privacy, but everybody saw what Eldad and Maydad were up to, would they find them more compelling leaders than Moses? Would this lead to division? But Moses wasn't worried. Moses said, don't be jealous on my behalf. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets. In this moment, Moses goes from saying, God, end my life, I cannot handle my lot, to would that all the Lord's people be prophets. I wonder if sharing the work in that communal visionary experience, if that was such a profound experience of the spirit resting upon Moses and the 70, plus Eldad and Maydad, I wonder if that was a transformative experience for Moses, where he was able to, well, himself be transformed, relax into leadership because he had a community of support that was helping him. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that some interpreters think Moses is being sarcastic because he still doesn't like being a prophet, and so he like wishes something that's loathsome on the people. But I don't agree with them. <laughs> I don't agree with them. I think that Moses is, is portrayed as going through a kind of transformation. All right. I'm reading the book of Numbers a lot lately because I'm working on a commentary on Numbers um, for the Believer's Church series. And you wouldn't believe how many people are incredulous and kind of borderline horrified when I tell them I'm writing about numbers. <laughs> they simply can't believe it, that I find it interesting, that I would accept this project, and they can't imagine the, that the book of numbers is important or relevant for me, for them, for Christians today. So it's my, it's my sort of personal mission <laughs> with this project to to invite people into the book of Numbers as not only a fascinating, intriguing book, but a deeply moving and profoundly human book. And this little story about Eldad and Medad and the 70 prophets and Moses' transformation through the shared resting of the spirit upon this community, I think it can invite us to reflect on how and in what ways we are open to the spirit at rest on us, the shared spirits at rest in our communities, and 
the spirit showing up in unexpected places. Who are the Eldads and Maydads around us, within us, um, in our communities, in our towns, in our world? Sometimes the spirit moves within our established institutions in ways that we can plan for. I remember, I mean, that sounds contradictory, planning for the spirit, but I remember Marlene Krupp, my seminary professor, teaching me that the spirit can move spontaneously in worship, but the spirit can also move when you're planning for worship, right? The spirit can move in your plans as well. So the spirit shows up sometimes when, where, where we expect the spirit to. But at other times, the spirit spills over or crops up in ways that surprise us and, if we're like Joshua, might horrify us a little. How can we be welcoming to these unexpected movements of the spirit? How can we ally ourselves with the spirit's work in unexpected places? Wherever God's spirit is active in the world, with or without our knowledge, with or without our permission, with or without our approval, there is love, just like in Maydad and Eldad's names. There is power, there is goodness, there is God. Can we join in that unexpected work? As I move toward closing, I want to tell one story um, from my time working in the Netherlands, which is a long time ago now, between 2002 and 2007. I think I visited Hively once um, to talk about it um, many years ago. But one of the projects that we embarked on together, I worked in a community center um, funded by the Dutch Mennonites and I was, my work was sponsored by Mennonite Mission Network. And we worked at community building and being a house of hospitality for a neighborhood that was uh, newly built, pretty newly built and pretty diverse in terms of who lived there. And we had this project. It was, wasn't my project. I arrived and they were already starting this project and I joined in. It was a community cookbook. And my colleagues were so excited. They're like, this will be a great way to build community, a great way to get to know our neighbors, a, a great way to, um, to really sort of get over the Dutch um, reserve about, about, about getting to know people different um, from you. I think, I mean, I share that reserve sometimes. I think that can be found in all cultures, but there is sort of a Western European reserve that they wanted to sort of find a way to find a, an avenue for Dutch people and people from other cultural backgrounds to, work, to be in this shared project together, get to know each other and build community. And so we sent out invitations. We, every single house in the neighborhood got an invitation to send in a recipe. We felt very self-satisfied. What a great project. Our mailbox was gonna flood with recipes. This was gonna be so great. We got three recipes. <laughs> and so we're like, okay, we gotta strategize. We were trying to do this project on our terms and people were probably like, what is this weird project and threw it away, right? So we got out of our comfort zone and started going two by two to give each other courage, knocking on doors and telling people about the project inviting them to participate. And that resulted, several years later, in an actual community cookbook that included recipes, photos, and stories about the recipes. We had to let go of how we thought the spirit was gonna move in this project and actually go to where the spirit was already moving. The folks in the neighborhood were not, you know, sitting around twiddling their thumbs saying, thank goodness there's this cookbook project I can participate in. They had rich full lives. And we, we needed to work harder to connect, to see what they were up to, to um, explain why we were interested in this. It was a learning experience for us. How, I don't know how that translates into your own experience. I don't know where the Eldads and Maydads are at Hively, in Elkhart, in Goshen, um, in this area, but they're there. The spirit is at work in unexpected places. I'm sure of that. Perhaps Psalm 104 says it best when it says, Lord, how manifold are your works. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. 
The Spirit of God is for us and rests with us and on us and in us, and thank God for that. It keeps us alive with every breath. It gives our life purpose and direction and meaning. It binds our community together. But the Spirit of God is not only for us. It is for the whole cosmos. From the goats to the lions to the trees of the Lord that this psalm references. All the created order. Could we welcome the Spirit to rest not only upon us, but the whole earth? Could we see Pentecost as one um, writer named J. Clinton McCann suggests? Could we see Pentecost as an ecological event and not just a human-centered event? Could we see Pentecost as hopeful, not just for the church and our individual church communities, not just for humans outside of our church structures, but for all that the God Spirit has created? Could the earth itself be one of our unexpected allies, our Eldad and Maydad in our Pentecost story? I find that hopeful, and I pray that it might connect with you as well. May we all be receptive to the Spirit at rest in our world, upon us, upon Hively Avenue Mennonite Church, in both expected ways and surprising places. May it be so. Amen. Our song of response will be number 436, O Lord my God, also known as How Great Thou Art, 436. And I invite us to stand to sing together. (laughs) 